All right, so Hollywood loves a good hunt for artifact story, doesn't it? Some priceless relic from an old civilization that someone's trying to get their hands on for either a lot of money or a lot of prestige and power. Bonus points, though, if you throw in a fedora, some snakes. The thing is, it's not that far off from the real world. Take the Museum of the Bible. The evangelical billionaires behind the Hobby Lobby chain that funded it got into a little bit of trouble when it opened back in 2017. This summer, Hobby Lobby paid a $3 million fine for illegally imported ancient tablets. Can scholars trust the artifacts that are in this museum? Well, uh, they can look, they can ask the other scholars that are a part of helping us put this museum together. All right, so yesterday, one of the items Hobby Lobby illicitly purchased finally made its way back to Iraq, a 3,500-year-old clay tablet called Gilgamesh, the Gilgamesh Dream, excuse me. It's one of the world's oldest pieces of literature worth about $1.7 million. In fact, it was looted from a museum 30 years ago and illegally imported first to London, then ultimately to the United States, then sold to the Hobby Lobby for its Bible Museum. Now, the Gilgamesh Dream is actually one of 17,000 archaeological artifacts. The Department of Justice made Hobby Lobby and Cornell University return to Iraq since this August. That's actually great news. But this Iraqi story is just one of countless around the world, from Ethiopia to Eastern Island some going back centuries to when colonial powers went around the world taking other countries' cultural artifacts to put on display for Western tourists or to house in exclusive private collections. And all along, countries have been demanding their items returned. Egypt still wants its iconic Rosetta Stone that was taken in the 18th century and is now on display in the British Museum. And the 3,000-year-old bust of Nefertiti, well, that's been in Germany. Germany actually told Egypt, no, they can't have it back, and said that Nefertiti's statue is and remains the ambassador of Egypt in Berlin. Really? I guess so. One of the most high-profile international disputes right now surrounds Greece's Parthenon marbles. That have been kept by the UK. In fact, Amal Clooney once worked on the case, and George, Matt, and Bill Murray have voiced that England should return it. England has also held on to the 150-carat Kuainur diamond from India, taken by the British East India Company. It's been sitting on a royal crown for years. India has asked for that back. But in 2013, then-Prime Minister David Cameron told them, I certainly don't believe in returnism. As it were, I don't think that's sensible. Sensible, depending on which country you're speaking from. Most of these stolen artifacts... It's chaos and conflict that made it even possible for them to be looted. Take the case of Iraq, for example. The market for valuable relics in Iraq took off after the first Gulf War in 1991, and then again during the 2003 U.S.-led invasion of that country. The same happened in Syria. This market is so lucrative that even ISIS joined in on it. The Wall Street Journal reported back in 2017 that one Syrian man began trading antiquities after being contacted by a top official of the Islamic State who sought his archaeological expertise to find Western buyers. So from governments to billionaires to terrorist groups, the supply lines of archaeological treasures have a lot of roots. But this is about more than just collecting art and antiquities. It's about the theft of culture and history from civilizations. Joining me now to discuss this is Maura Kersel, an archaeological and associate professor of anthropology at DePaul University. She's also co-director of the Follow the Pots Project, which explores archaeological looting. Uh, professor, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for your time. I mean, the prized Gilgamesh tablet has been returned to Iraq. It's one of, as I mentioned, 17,000 artifacts that have been returned uh, since August, the largest ever repatriation of looted Iraqi antiquities. It's just a drop in the bucket, but how big of a deal is this? This is huge. I mean, this is one of, first of all, it is a high profile case. It's a really important artifact for the people of Iraq. And this actually demonstrates that Iraq has it's some sort of uh, some sense of restorative justice in this repatriation, as Iraq is no longer seen as the disempowered victim of the crime, and now they are actually the you know empowered people who are going to have their cultural heritage back. I want to talk a little bit about the Hobby Lobby, because the, the Hobby Lobby, owned by the, the Donald Trump-supporting evangelical billionaire uh, Green family, David Green in particular, was fined $3 million by the DOJ four years ago for illicitly getting many of those Iraqi artifacts. But 
Uh, Hobby Lobby is now suing a pretty prominent Oxford professor named Dirk Obing, uh, a man who taught and worked with ancient texts for selling them antiquities that were stolen. Some allege, you know, by him since he had access to so many, he's denied the claims, but it really speaks to me to the different kinds of people and groups that could be involved in this illicit trade. I mean, what do you know about how these products ultimately get into the hands of those that are collecting them and even ultimately museums? So it's an excellent question, and it's been sort of my life's work to figure out how artifacts go from the ground to the consumer, because it really is a demand-driven enterprise where would there be looting if there was no demand? Perhaps there'd be less looting, but for sure there would still be looting. And so figuring that out, I mean, the many hands that an artifact can uh, pass through, it's its quite incredible, actually, as they go from the ground, uh, you know, somebody loots it, then an intermediary comes and picks it up and pays a small amount, less than usually, typically less than 1% to the looter of the eventual sale price. Then it goes on to a middle person and then it may cross an international border, it gets laundered along the way and eventually ends up legally available for sale. Um, and people like Steve Green then purchase it at places like Christie's. And I should add that he is also involved in a lawsuit and, uh, related to the Gilgamesh tablet where he's suing Christie's for uh, lack of provenance information that they didn't provide him with the information he needed in order to make an educated purchase. Yeah, and it's, it's certainly one thing when we can trace the item like uh, in Iraq to individuals and organizations. It's a lot harder when you're up against a former colonial power that took something when they pretty much pillaged your country, right? I mean, is there any chance you think that a country like Egypt or India, for example, will ever get back items like the bust of, of Nefertiti or, or the uh, Koi Ainur diamond? Well, and I mean, as you pointed out, the uh, Parthenon marbles are an excellent example of this from the British Museum. I think actually this is the moment where museums are having to interrogate their collections and the colonial legacies that they in either inherited or continue. And so I think that this is the moment, if we're ever gonna see these things going back, this is the moment where it's gonna happen. Would you agree, though, that it's a kind of like cultural theft to keep these items? I mean, what, what's your opinion of the argument that is oftentimes made, if not outright publicly, but certainly privately, that many of these home countries uh, would not be able to take care of these incredibly valuable relics, uh, and that in some ways they serve as ambassadors of those civilizations to the Western world? Well, I'm a product of person who grew up going to the Royal Ontario Museum, and I'm probably an archaeologist because I saw amazing treasures from other places. That said, I think the sort of situational or cultural imperialism embedded in saying that countries can't take care of this is, uh, I don't agree with that. And I have a huge problem with museums taking that stance, because it's a very Western, white Western-centered uh, notion where you are saying people in less developed nations can't take care of their culture, which is patently false. And I got to ask you finally, as an archaeologist who uh, follows these stories, is there a particular case, is there a particular artifact that you're following very closely, a fight that's been interesting to see unfold, like this Gilgamesh tablet? So I'm pretty obsessed with the marbles that are in the British Museum, and I'm very interested to see how that plays out, because I think Britain can't really just put their head in the sand anymore. I really think the British Museum is going to have to reconsider um, what they do with the marbles and whether or not they'll repatriate them. All right, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, certainly come back and uh, keep us uh, up to date on whether or not they uh, get returned to uh, Greece. That'd be great. Thank you so much, Would Professor. Be... Yeah, certainly. <laughs> we'll be following it closely. Morag Kersel, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate your insights.